in the name of Jesus. 2 Samuel 21 from verse 1. The Bible says there was famine in the days of David for three consecutive years. And David sought the face of the Lord. I'm reading from Amplified. But read your King James or whatever is available. He sought the face of the Lord. He sought the presence of God asking for the reason behind the famine. Now, the famine had occurred in the first year and David did not inquire. He thought it was a random thing. And then the famine occurred the second year. And they thought, well, the weather forecast had said um, that because there is this, uh, you know, air that is coming from the Sahara, it, it has brought famine. And maybe meteorologically speaking, something is going on in the heavenlies that hindered the rain. But no problem, we're going to sit and wait. Ha, like Pastor was saying before, some people's problem is they are still waiting. But you're not supposed to be just sitting. In fact, waiting on the Lord is not a passive activity. Waiting on the Lord is an intentional thing. Hala Masia. You are waiting to hear. You wake up and you hear with the ear of the one who has been taught. With the one who has been discipled. You hear like Enoch. When the Bible says Enoch walked with God. You are hearing in that way. The name Enoch means the one who's been discipled, who's been tutored. Who tutored him? God. And so you and I, that's why the sister was leading us that we have another comfort. He's a personal tutor. You know, like at university, I have students and I'm their personal tutor. They get more out of me than other students. So the, the Holy Spirit is your personal tutor. And he wants you to wake up every day and hear like the person who has already taken this subject before. You're not hearing like the ignorant. You're not hearing like the unbeliever. You are hearing like the person for whom the Spirit of God lives in them. So, when you're waiting on God, you need to inquire and hear as the learned. So when the famine repeated the third year, and I don't want us to minimize the impact of famine in those days. Famine was not a joke. Because famine meant that people were dying. Livestock were, 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 were dying. And that means poverty had entered. Because their wealth was in the, 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 the animals, isn't it? It was in the livestock. So they were getting poorer and poorer. Over a period of three years, imagine how much they lost. And you know, if they didn't ask God, he would have held his peace. There are some prayers that until you pray, God will hold his peace. You will not dream the dream. You will not see the vision. But as an intercessor, there are some prayers you need to pray so that the heavens can begin to speak to you. And then you now pray prophetically. And you're not praying like someone beating the air. It's now targeted. So David asked the Lord, what is the reason why there's been a famine for three years? Some of the situations you've learned to be content with, you're meant to be fed up by it, by now. Because you've seen the cycle. The cycle happened to your mom. It happened to your dad. And now it's happening to you. The cycle happened to your auntie. Everybody in the family calls her negative names. But that thing is trying to come to you. Don't tolerate it. Inquire of the Lord. Don't get used to the unacceptable. Don't get comfortable with the uncomfortable. It is not a mark of spiritual maturity to tolerate the devil stealing, killing, and destroying. Your life should not be fair game to them. If they steal from you, something must die in their camp. It must get to that level that you're intolerant of their nonsense. When David kept quiet for three years, animals carried on dying. The grass was no longer green. There was nothing green anymore. People were struggling. Water was drying up. God kept quiet until he said, Lord, what is going on? And the Bible says the Lord replied and says it is because of Saul and his bloody house because he put the Gibeonites to death. As soon as he said that, David understood the story. Now, child of God, at this time, Saul is no longer alive. Saul's dead. Dead and buried. The incident God was referencing had happened 70 years prior to this occasion. 70 years prior. So, because
because you know when Saul was walking in error when you're walking in error you bind your intercessors you bind your destiny helpers you gossip about them you tell stories about them you bind the good and you lose the evil when there's a spirit of error you can see people going the wrong direction Saul had a spirit of error on him and when he has a spirit of error God says so go and kill the Amalekites kill everything nothing should be left did he? he left Agag to torment the children of God in the days of Esther because Haman was the seed of Agag when you're walking in error you create problems for your future I pray for you child of God Every curse that wants you to walk in error, we break it now by the blood of Jesus. Galatians 3, 13 and 14. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the Lord. He made a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone who hangs on the tree that the blessing of Abraham might come upon us the Gentiles that we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Every spirit of error that wants you to dig a home for yourself, to dig a pit for yourself, I bind it now. I rebuke it. I command it. Lose your hold over the church of God. You will not make a mistake. You will not make a mistake. In the name of Jesus, you will not bind what you're supposed to lose. You will not lose what you're supposed to bind. But you will bind what the heavens have already bound. Because the Bible says in Matthew 18, 18, whatsoever things you bind, they are already bound in heaven. If you read it in the Amplified, Whatever you lose, it is already loosed in heaven. So you discern what am I meant to be binding right now? What am I meant to be loosing? And you bind appropriately and loose appropriately. Saul was in error. He's supposed to kill the Amalekites. But he left them. And he went to kill the Gibeonites. Why couldn't he kill the Gibeonites? You have to go back to Judges. That Dr. Sam was taking us to this, this morning. Hallelujah. In the book of Judges something happened to Joshua and the elders and that something still happens to us today deception Saul killed the Gibeonites that caused famine for David and the people of Israel 70 years later what does that tell you the enemy plays a long ball and he keeps records the kingdom of darkness keeps records the Lord opened my eyes and I saw the enemy talking to his generals, the principalities. He said, I want you to stop all your work against these people. And I want you to go into the histories of their bloodlines. And I want you to find the legal ground for us to afflict them. And I saw these uh, fallen angels carrying boxes, you know, like what lawyers carry when they are presenting a case. I saw them carrying files. And when I looked into some of the boxes, the handwriting was old. It was like written with a feather and, you know, the ink they used to dip in. And I saw that they had records about families. And the Lord said, do you know what happened in your bloodline 70 years ago? Do you know the experiences of your mother, your father, your grandfather, your great-grandfather? Do you know everything about them? And you know, one thing about us human beings, we have a side that is very sentimental. One thing that I don't do is I'm not misled. I might love my mom, I might love my dad, but I don't look at them through rose-tinted glasses. Some of you already have the prayer points for your deliverance. You already have the prayer points that will make you the woman God ordained you to be. But you refuse to accept it because mommy is perfect. That is perfect. You saw what they were doing, but you've not repented about it. You've not said anything about it. You acted like nothing happened. And I don't know about you, but where I come from in Africa, they're very secretive. Unless God gives you a vision, they will hide the story. They will hide it very, very well. I was a 30-year-old woman before I discovered some things about my family, close family members. And then I was told by other people. One of my cousins had an encounter with social services. Her children were removed. And then I stepped forward, I think I was 28 then, and I said I was going to foster her son and when they were doing the assessment they said let's write your family tree so we wrote our family tree they said you've got it wrong I said no it's not wrong they said it is wrong I said no it's not wrong they said but this person 
you are saying is your uncle and is the father of your cousin is not the father of your cousin uh -uh. I said what you mean we grew up together in the same city she is the daughter of my I said no she's not maybe you could call her a grandchild but she's not his daughter long story I only discovered this as an so I rang my mom I said mama what's going on she said ah you know these things and these are not the things we talk about you see and your uncle won't be happy if we discuss it and let's just accept it like that I said so you knew all this while she said of course I knew but it's not what we talk to people about even my uncle's so called daughter she didn't know until later on in life and it caused soul wounds that's another story but what I'm saying is do you know your bloodline do you really, really, really know them? Listen, Saul kills the Gibeonites and it's David and other people reaping his error. So that tells me in the realm of the spirit, something could have happened 70 years ago that the enemy is asking for his pound of flesh today and opposing your prayers and finding legal ground before the enemy could shut the heavens over David who was an anointed king. Remember, David is anointed. And he is anointed. God is okay with David. But the enemy could shut the heavens over David because Saul had killed the Gibeonites. So when Saul did that error, because he did it as king of Israel, he included all the Israelites in the error. There are some errors that come from Downing Street. Unless you say minus me and my family, there is an assumption in the spirit realm that you agreed. Yeah. I found that devil and his friends, they are not outright in getting agreements. You remember I told you about the trading floors of Lucifer. They are not always going to say, uh, come to my trading floor. I, I want to give you alcohol. I want to introduce you to Jack Daniels. Because they'll know you say, God forbid, what nonsense. But instead, they'll give you a dream. In that dream, you saw a pretty girl. And in the dream, you and the girl were really lovely friends. You know, you were necking each other, hugging. It's just a dream. After it's not a bad thing. And then you wake up in the morning, you are, you're just like, the blood, the blood, the blood, I'm going. No. There is a covenant being instituted in the realm of the spirit. It needs to be renounced. It needs to be revoked. You need to make it very clear. That Amos 3.3 can do what to do. I will not agree. Hallelujah. The enemy is like that. But I like that slogan from Nigeria. It says, this year, we no go grieve for anybody. Hey, we no go grieve. So you have to make it explicit that you are refusing, you are renouncing any strange policies coming from Downing Street, anything coming from the mayor of Liverpool, anything coming from the... That's why you should know what is happening. Don't be like, I'm an intercessor. I don't know what's going on. You need to know what's going on so that you know what to refuse. Yes, 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 yes. And unless you explicitly refuse, they'll say you agreed. One of my sisters in Christ, she shared with me, you know, we have this women's prayer retreat that we've been going to. She told me that when we went for the prayer retreat last year, there were some things she had accepted without realizing it. And then when we began to pray, she said it dawned on her. When she got married, her mom came to the wedding and spoke to her and said, you know, in our family, it's very hard to have children. And she said, I didn't oppose it. I just listened and thought, that's how this family has been. My grandma went through the same thing. My mom went through the same thing. So that's just how it is. Until in the place of prayer, it dawned on her. Ah, ah, I've agreed to this thing. How on earth can God give me a miracle when I've agreed? Are you with me, child of God? So when David came into power, he was supposed to renounce the evils of Saul's kingdom so that he could have a fresh start. So no matter what he was building, there was still that error in the foundations that said you killed the Gibeonites. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Now you may ask, what was wrong with killing the Gibeonites? Go back to the book of Joshua. In Joshua 9, in the book of Joshua, one day they've come to camp in Gilgal. Now, you know, Gilgal, that word, is a word that's repeated twice. And in the Hebrew, it means to roll away, to roll away. So you're rolling away twice, so that indeed the reproach of Egypt is surely 
well and truly rolled away. So they were in Gilgal. Remember, they have been circumcised afresh in Gilgal. In Gilgal, they renounced the ways of Pharaoh. And the enemy knows, once you've renounced the ways of Pharaoh, there's nothing he can do about you. You're just going to prosper. But they said, how can we put in them another covenant that will give us a doorway into their bloodlines? So these Gibeonites came. And in those days, obviously, there's no holiday inn, no travel lodge, no premier inn, no crown plaza, what, what. They came wearing raggedy clothes. They were carrying moldy bread. And they used that physical appearance to prove to the Israelite leaders that they had come from a far place. It's not all that glitters that is gold. And it's not, things are not always the way they seem. Sometimes you need to look again. Look again. Like Moses with the burning bush. Don't just look once. Look again. If they'd looked again at the Gibeonites and asked the Lord, Lord, what do we do with these people? You'll have told them, make no covenants with these people. Because they're supposed to be taking their land, not agreeing with them. But they didn't ask. They were moved by the physical, what was in front of them. And they entered into a covenant with the Gibeonites. The covenant was, we'll never kill you. We will never kill you. When that covenant was made, the Israelites, of course, they immediately regretted it the very next day when they found out that the Gibeonites are their neighbors. Now, remember, there's a covenant that has been entered into through deception. Yet, in the spirit realm, it stood. Yes. So, Satan can lie to you and lie about things. Appear in the dream that they are giving you a gift, but hidden in that gift is initiation into the evil priesthood of your bloodline. Do you get it? You could have a dream where they are giving you food, but that's not food, that's cancer. God forbid for you. So, even though he lied, that evil thing will still stand until you renounce it. So the Israelites stayed with the covenant of the Gibeonites. 430 years, and then Saul came and killed them. But the 430 year old covenant brought a backlash. What does that teach you? Even in this land, even in our bloodlines, when I say bloodlines, I mean your father's family line, your mother's family line, if you are married, your spouse's family line. All those lines, they are bloodlines because there is a blood that is connecting you all, all the way back to Adam and Eve. And the enemy tracks bloodlines. He's looking, remember I told you, he's looking for legal grounds within that bloodline. For 430 years, that covenant with the Gibeonites, it was there, it stood, it was speaking, but nobody violated it. So there was no judgments and no verdicts because nobody had violated it. And then came Saul, walking in error, he violated the covenant with the Gibeonites when he killed them. And he gave Satan legal grounds to attack the nation of Israel. But he kept that legal ground in his pocket until when the chosen one of God, the one that God had anointed and appointed, was on the throne. And then he opposed the kingdom of David. Are you with me? Stay with me. So now you say, how does this apply to me? Think about your own bloodline. In our bloodlines, some of you are born in, in bloodlines of seers. You are seers from the bloodline. But once upon a time, the seers in your bloodline did not understand that we have to see through our high priest, Yeshua Hamashiach Tzikenu. They didn't understand the Melchizedek priesthood. So because they were seers, people initiated them to see through the eyes of the python spirit, through the eyes of the serpentine spirit, through witchcraft and sorcery. So they used other ways to activate that gift. That gift was activated and a covenant was made with the fallen son of God. Because no witch has any power until they are given by Lucifer and the fallen sons of God. Remember when the angels fell in Revelation 12, they did not get stripped of their gifts. They arrived on this dimension with the same kind of uh, gifting and anointings they have. Just now they've perverted them. So when in Genesis 6, it talks about how the sons of God began to look and all of a sudden, 
an angel who never used to care about how pretty you are. They began attracted to the human women. Why? Because Jude tells us they had left their original state. Yeah. So in their backslidden state, in rebellion to God, they started to fancy human women. And then they began to sleep with human women and they had the offspring called the Nephilim. Now, who are the Nephilim? They were the ones who came to make sure Jesus would never be born. To continue the rebellion. Because as long as a human being has the DNA of fallen angels, the blood of Jesus cannot work for them. And Jesus could not have come because he had to come through a line that was free of Nephilim blood. Okay? But now those fallen angels, they had women. What do you think they were talking with those women on the pillow? What do you think was their pillow talk? They initiated those women into the occultic realm. Are you with me? Those women were taught secrets of the spirit realm. That they then taught to their children and their neighbors and people. They became the evangelists of the occultic realm of Lucifer. Are you with me? Come now through our bloodlines. Your bloodline might have at one time had encounters with the Nephilim. You have that one grandma who was a seer. Who is she seeing through? She's seeing through the Nephilim. The Nephilim are still very much operating now because they tend to dominate the waters. And God showed me that here in the UK, almost everywhere has water running under, underground. You could be on a road, a pavement, and underneath that pavement is a canal of water. The Nephilim have dominated the water realms. And as they dominate the water realms, they are seeking to open up the realms of the spirit in rebellion to how the Holy Spirit opens up. So you are here. You are an intercessor. God called you. You are a prophetic intercessor. You are an evangelist. God called you. But every time you try to exercise your gift according to the ways of the Lord, that Nephilim question comes in. And they question you. Why? Because you are breaking a covenant that your bloodlines agreed to years ago. Do you get me? The covenant with the Gibeonites did not present a problem until somebody broke it. Then it could be used to bring famine. As long as you are not seeing according to the Spirit of God, they don't have a problem with you. That's why some people say, before I gave my life to Christ, my life was better. It's a pity. It's because when you gave your life to Christ, those covenants that are already in force, they have to wake up and question you because you've never disagreed with them. Is somebody following me? That day, they made a covenant with the water spirit and they said, okay, we, we want babies. And the water spirit said, right, you've got a baby. But what they didn't understand is what they left by that altar is that all the females in that family shouldn't get married. Their marriages are now the price of the peace of yesterday. Yeah? The day you come and you make up your mind, say, I'm not having a child out of wedlock. I'm going to wait and get married. But you're trying to get married is hard. It's hard. You pray, 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 pray. You push, push, push. Eventually, you meet one crazy brother who is willing to be crazy with you. You push, push, push. You get married. Then you're married now. They fight, 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 fight. You're wondering, what is the fight about? It's because once upon a time, the bloodline had sold all the marriages. Now, for your marriage to be at ease, you have to remove their legal ground. Yeah. Renounce that covenant. Renounce that evil verdict. And say, as for me and my household, you cannot speak here. Am I talking to somebody? Yes. There are some things that lie dormant in the spirit realm until you want to lift your head. And they say, who do you think you are? Nobody in your bloodline did this. Who is a pastor in your family? Who do you think you are? And so they're going to push the heat, push the heat until some people backslide or they give up. And they say, oh, the pastor's not anointed. I found another church. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to be, uh, I'll follow the man of God who's praying at 7 a.m. Because there's something wrong with our church. No, you're joking. There's nothing wrong with your church. There's nothing wrong with anything. But it's because you are violating the conditions of the covenants. And you need to break those covenants. You need to renounce those covenants. You know, some people today are the price of yesterday's peace. 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 
Something was chasing them in the compound. And they said, oh, there's one woman who helps. And then they went to the fake destiny helper. And they say, help us. And they say, yes, we'll help you. But in exchange, they say, we will lock up all the stars of your family. Anyone who is born, who has a star, we are going to frustrate them because we're going to grab the star. Do you get it? And then you come and you're wondering what the push is about. We're going to pray shortly. I'll give you some examples. There was once upon a time a man. This is not a fairy tale. This man, every church he goes to, nobody remembers his name. And his name was not a Zulu name with clicks. He wasn't no Matamsa Ngamkandla. No. It was an easy name, like Paul. But nobody remembered his name. Every church he'd go to, he'd be invisible. And he was so frustrated. When he goes for job applications, don't get the job. Anything he tries, it doesn't work. Until he came to this meeting. And as the intercessors were praying, they saw that he is the price of yesterday's peace. In his bloodline, his grandfather was very wealthy. And had joined the 33rd rank of the Masonic people. You know that 30, 33rd degree rank of Masons? They're very dangerous. And many people look at them and go, oh, bless. We don't have such in my bloodline. You're joking. Some of them are pastors and they're in the 33rd degree. So you cannot be sentimental about your bloodline. Me, I don't take any prisoners. I'm not sentimental. It doesn't matter. Even if you're my sister, I'm not going to kill you. But I have to deal with the spirit going on. So this guy was the price of yesterday's peace. So they saw that his grandfather had done a ritual and there was a coffin. You know, they do this coffin ritual. And part of that coffin, what was buried inside, all the males in that bloodline were never going to amount to anything. So he took the glory in future and pulled it to his natural run. Child of God, if the demonic people can do that, how much more you a child of God? There are some treasures embedded in the dimensions of heaven. That God is waiting for you to pull in the place of prayer into the natural realm. Radavasiya. There is a bill, a debt you need to pay. You know, you can pull the resources of heaven and place a demand and pull it into the natural. So now, when that was exposed, they prayed for that guy, brought him out of the coffin. Funny enough. Funny enough. When church service ended. Hi, Paul. Hi, Paul. Monday, phone call. Paul, that interview you came to, we're so sorry we declined you. Please, can you come? Do you still want to come? All of a sudden. All of a sudden. Huh. The price of yesterday's peace. Somebody wanted a baby and they sold everybody in the blood. Because that's how Satan is. Once you get on his trading floors, oh my word, he doesn't have gifts to give. He's a robber. He will steal so much from the bloodline. Was giving them a little thing, a little bit of money. Is somebody with me? And we are going to pray because our bloodlines must be free. When your bloodline is free, your destiny will speak. Yes, your destiny speaks. When evil covenants are renounced and denounced, your destiny will speak. When the enemy comes in a flood, the Spirit of God will say, Who have you come for here? And raise the standard. And they're not able to rob. That's why the, the, the Bible says in that first Peter 5 8 that be sober, be vigilant for your adversary. You know that word adversary? In the Greek is the word anti dikos. Anti dikos. Anti meaning against, dikos meaning your rights. You have rights as a born again child of God. And then there is this fallen angel. With his friends that they fell together. They no longer have the glory of God. And they have no other assignment but to oppose your rights. Be sober, be vigilant. He's prowling around like a roaring lion. Looking for whom to devour. That means it's not everybody who's devourable. If everybody was devourable, he wouldn't prowl around. You'll just have supper and breakfast and lunch. You'll just be grabbing, grabbing, grabbing. But it's not everyone he can devour. Because when he comes to examine you, he finds that he has nothing in common with you. And there is no doorway. There is no legal ground. They, they search your bloodline. And all they can see is a flood of the blood. The blood, the blood, the blood. The blood, the blood, the blood. And then they have nothing to say. Before we pray, I want to show you two things. 
The Lord Jesus spoke to the to the to the disciples, teaching them about prayer in Luke 18. And he told them about the, the widow woman. And he says, This woman, he says, men ought always to pray and not faint. And that's a message for you. Remember, after today, don't say I prayed for six hours. Now I'm just gonna eat and drink until Jesus comes. No, men ought to always pray. What this session is giving you is increasing your capacity. Yes. So that after now, when other people go to bed, you say, no, I have a work to do. I have a work to do. There's a reason I was born in this family. There's a reason I live in Liverpool. There's a reason I worship in Glory Church. The assignment has to speak. And you speak. So he said, men are to pray and not faint. And he says, there was a certain, in a certain city, he knew that if he gives you the name of the city, you say, ah, but I live in Liverpool, you know. Um, and this woman was in Thai and Sedan. And how's that comparable? He says, in a certain city. In other words, it's a blank. Put the name of any city there. She lived in a certain city. And there was a judge there who did not fear God. Just like the familiar spirits in your bloodline don't fear God. They fear him to the extent that they, when, he, when he rebukes them, they'll back off. But the things they do show that they don't have the true fear of God. Are you with me? And he says he had no respect for man. He wasn't even bothered about the level of the wickedness. And then, in the Amplified, he says they came a desperate widow. Are you desperate? Are you tired of being tired? Are you tired of nightmares? Things chasing you in the dream? Some people, they'll come to... To church is a glorious service and that night is the day that they're having sex in the dream why because the enemy trying to bind them again and instead of rising up and saying i divorce every entity from the pit of hell i reject the incubus and the succubus by the blood of jesus i break all covenants with you i burn your marriage certificates and your rings and whatever rights you have taken through my family, I break it by fire. You instead wake up ashamed, a bit uh, bashful, and then you just say the blood, the blood, the blood. No. If after prayer, you get an attack in your dream, know that your prayer is worked. And you need to rise up and speak against those entities. Because they won't bother you if you are not free. Yes. I know a sister in Christ. She had a diagnosis of cancer, which was a lying spirit. And any time she recovers, she'll have a dream she's being raped. And I say it's not a rape. It's because they're trying to deposit the spirit of death. So rise up like a mad woman. And they, sometimes they think I'm... They're like, mm, it is well. So if you're attacked, just know that your prayer is working. You know that... Uh, that song that they sing in Nigeria, Onaga, Onaga. Is it working? It's working. Eh? It's working. Don't be tempted to uproot. You know, you plant a seed of prayer by faith. Afterwards, don't go and uproot it and say nothing is happening. There's something wrong with this church. After praying for six hours, nothing happened. No. There is something happening. Are you going to stand your ground? There was a desperate widow. And the widow kept coming to the unrighteous judge and saying, Avenge me of my enemy. Is it in your Bible? Okay, you're in the Amplified like me. God bless you. You know, in the King James, she says, Avenge me of my enemy. In the Amplified, she says, You know, can you give me justice and legal protection from my adversary? Give me what? Justice. And legal protection from my adversary. That the justice of God is like this. If there is a legal ground for Lucifer and his agents, the justice of God prohibits God from helping you. Then some people get angry because they say, God, if you really wanted to help me, you'd have helped me by now. But you know what? God has always been willing. You know, he's willing. The problem is not with God. If there's something you're praying for and it's stubborn, it's not shifting. You're an intercessor. You're praying for something. It's stubborn. It's not shifting. I want you to settle it in your heart. That the delay is not coming from God. Because God is willing. Take care of the legal ground that the enemy is using to oppose you. 
God already answered you like Daniel 21 days ago. Are you with me? The angel appeared to Daniel in Daniel 10, isn't it? And said from the first day you humbled yourself and you sought the face of the Lord. The Lord released me. He dispatched the royal mail. He dispatched the, the head of the royal mail. I can see the prophets here in the house. You're all part of the royal mail. You were dispatched 21 days to release the prophetic word to the church. And then in the second heavens, there was a wrestling from the antidecos who is saying, no, 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 no. God already released it. Now the antidecos, you have to take care of them. You have to take care of them in the place of prayer. The woman was not put off. That's why Jesus said, pray and not be tired. Don't say I prayed about this last year. Don't say we've been praying since January. Pray and not be tired. Give me justice. The justice of God says, if the blood of Jesus has taken care of everything, and all covenants and trades and initiations and dedications have been taken care of, the justice of God says, there is a verdict that's been released from heaven. That says today is your Kairos moment. It is your season. It is your time. Receive what God ordained for you. So when we will start praying, we will take care of the legal grounds and we're going to appeal to the justice of God. Because God is a righteous judge. Jesus said, this unrighteous judge, when the woman kept coming back, when the woman kept coming back, when she did not give up, when she kept coming back, coming back, the judge eventually gave her what she needed. And he says in verse 7, And will not our just God, the just judge of the universe, will he not defend and avenge his elect? Will he not release justice for them? Will he delay in giving them justice? No. It is not in the nature of God to be unrighteous. He will not delay his justice when we come and everything is in order. He already decided to bless you. He is the one who moved our pastors and leaders to put this day. Because he already wanted to bless you. But he knew that there was a question mark somewhere. There was a keep your night story somewhere. There was a judges and Joshua story somewhere. That somebody is trying to make you the price of yesterday's peace. And he wants to silence that. In Revelation 12, we all know this account. That war broke out in heaven, isn't it? And when war broke out in heaven, we discovered something. God the Father is too big to fight Lucifer. God the Son is too big to fight Lucifer. The war was not between God and Lucifer. But war broke out between the angelic beings. So Michael and his angels with Lucifer and his angels. And we found that Lucifer prevailed not. Hallelujah. They prevailed not. In the Amplified, it says in Revelation 12, 8, but they were not strong enough. Lucifer and his fallen angels, they were not strong enough and did not prevail. And there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. Good news for you. Jesus says when he died for us, that we have been raised up together with him and made to sit together with him in heavenly places. Far above all principalities and powers, rulers and spiritual wickedness in high places and every name that is to be named, both in this world and in the world to come. So, you are not an earth dweller. You know in Revelation 12, when the Bible says, in Revelation 12, 12, Rejoice, O heavens, after Lucifer and his angels have been thrown out of heaven. Rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell on the earth. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you in great wrath, knowing that his time is only short. I want you to tap your neighbor and say, they didn't mean me. I am not an earth dweller. Because the earth dwellers are the ones crawling around on the dust. That is the food of the serpent. But you are not an earth dweller. You see, your physical body might be touching the land in Liverpool because God wants a point of contact with this generation. We were handpicked for this assignment. God knew that in 2024, I needed somebody who stands like the gates to heaven that can open a portal in the realm of the spirit so that when my angels need to ascend and descend, that person has a, a realm around them that opens up the heavens. And so he gave you a body so that you can legally function on 
on the earth. But don't be confused. That you have a physical body does not make you an earth dweller. Because the Bible says in Hebrews 12, 22, but we have come to Mount Zion. We have come to the city of the living God. We have come to the heavenly Jerusalem. We have come to the innumerable company of angels. Hallelujah. In festive gathering. That is rejoicing in heaven because bloodlines are loose. That is rejoicing in heaven because the apostles are loose. The prophets are loose. The pastors are loose. The evangelists are loose. The teachers are loose. He says we have come to the innumerable company of angels. We have come to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. And then in verse 24. We have come to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. We have come to the mercy seat, who is a being. The mercy seat, who is our Lord. The word that became flesh. The one who was in the beginning. And the Bible says, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. And the same was with God from the beginning. And there was nothing that was made that was not made through the word. That same word who creates destinies, who creates, who can make or break and remake. Hallelujah. That same word is our mercy seat. He has power. And he says we have come to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, a God between. So Jesus is saying, Father God, I hear Lucifer is accusing them. You know, like that dream you had, Pastor. I discovered that sometimes we have old prophets who dislike young prophets. And they raise up accusations against them in the realm of the spirit. But Jesus is coming in intercession. And that mercy seat is releasing a voice in the realm of the spirit. The blood of Jesus has a voice. And the voice is saying, mercy over judgment. Mercy over judgment. Mercy over judgment. So we are going to start our prayers in a minute. And we're going to be coming to God as the just judge of the universe. Like that widow woman. To come and get justice for our bloodlines. We want God to weigh up the history of our families. On the scales of divine justice. And we want God to find the enemy and his agents wanting. Do you remember Belshazzar? Who is in the lineage of Nebuchadnezzar? When he dared to take the cups of God. And begin to drink stupid wine in them. He saw a handwriting on the wall. Oh and he says, Mene, Mene, take a passive. Numbered, numbered. Your kingdom's days are numbered. You have been weighed on the scales of heavenly justice and found wanting. And your kingdom will never stand again. Your kingdom's taken away from you. There is a kingdom contending with you. But you are not alone. You are representative of the kingdom of heaven. I said, You're not an earth dweller. You are right now seated together with Christ in heavenly places. But to you has been given a measure of faith. So that over your mountain of influence, you will say, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on the earth now as it is in heaven. In my bloodline, my DNA speak all the way back to Adam and Eve. Let your kingdom come in this bloodline. Let your kingdom come in this DNA. So that I can be a voice in Liverpool that cannot be insulted or argued with. Are you with me? We have come to Mount Zion. Revelation 12. There was an accuser described in Revelation 12 10. Revelation 12 10. He says they began to rejoice in heaven. And says the accuser of the brethren has been cast down. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom and the dominion of God and the dominion of his Christ has come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God, day and night has been cast down. And they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives to death. What does that mean? It means that they had a surrendered life. They were like Romans 12 verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you yield yourself, surrender, your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God which is your reasonable worship and be renewed in your mind do not be conformed to the ways of this world at that point the accuser is silenced so in Revelation 12 10 when the Bible talks about the accuser 
is that Greek word kategoreo. And what it means is this, is that he's looking for you to justify yourself. So that let's say you are 99.9% righteous. If you are not 0.01% problematic ahead, the legal ground stands. Are you with me? That's why Jesus on the Sermon to the Mount told them, agree with your adversary whilst you are yet on the way to court. Because if you keep being stubborn, how can you be stubborn? We say repent, you still have nothing to repent of. We say your bloodline has a problem. You say my mother was perfect, my father was perfect, my uncles were perfect, everyone was wonderful. You have given the adversary something to talk. Because that mother you said is perfect, she was a gossip. The father you said is perfect. How did he end up with three children outside the marital home? And now you have a brother here and a sister here. Wheresoever he went, he went around doing good. Hey! So, do you get me? So when we say repent, I'm not asking you to say, Oh God, forgive me, I had crackers and cheese when pastor said we should fast. No, I'm saying enter your bloodlines. Allow Holy Spirit to speak to you. Some bloodlines have rapists and you covered it up that your uncle raped somebody in the family that your brother has been doing things some of them are armed robbers and it might not be be today but maybe three generations ago there was a witch in your family she controlled the heavenlies with witchcraft maybe Simon the sorcerer was your uncle remember how he bewitched the people of Samaria so when I say repent you are making sure that the category because he works at a point of law. So you could be 99.9% righteous, living a good life. But maybe once in a while, there's like a strange anointing that comes up. And then you call it Holy Ghost anger. You say it's righteous anger. Even Jesus overturned the tables. And then the enemy says, and hey, she's behaving just like her auntie in 1548. So we'll use that one as a landing ground. God forbid. So when we're coming in repentance, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb. So your only answer to satanic accusations is what? The blood of the Lamb. Yes, you're going to repent on behalf of your bloodlines. And I want you to be thorough. Say my bloodlines, you know, call your surnames. You know, from my father's bloodline. I am calling them your family to repentance. I've come to represent them. We, we read Ezekiel 22, 30. God is seeking in our bloodlines for that man, that woman, who will stand in the gap so that our bloodlines can be transformed. Remember, we don't want Nephilim bloodlines, bloodlines of rebellion. So you be patient and say from my father's side, from my mother's side, from my spouse's father's side, their mother's side. Anything that you know that is evil in your bloodline, don't overlook it. Don't overlook it. If you say, well, my bloodline has been so wonderful, I don't know anything. Go to Exodus 20. Find the Ten Commandments. I can assure you that someone in your bloodline broke all of them. And repent and say, on behalf of myself and my bloodline. You say, but patience, why are we praying like this? Do you remember Daniel? Do you remember Nehemiah? Do you remember Ezra? From what we read about them, was there a problem with Daniel personally in his work with God? When you read about Daniel, do you find a problem with him? Do you? I don't. But when he prays, he says, I am my fathers. I am my fathers. God, we have sinned against you. And so before the angel Gabriel could be sent to him, he did this what we call identification repentance. I am my father's house. Look at Nehemiah. When Nehemiah was in the courts of the king, did we see a problem with him? No. But when he prayed, he says, God, I and my forefathers, we have sinned against you. So why? Why do we do that? We want our DNA to be an intercessory tool. So that when I stand before the courtrooms of heaven, is there a judge without a courtroom? When the Bible talks about God as the just judge, he has a court, he presides over it, but it's a court of mercy. And when the accuser accuses people day and night, where do you think he's accusing them? He's a prosecuting attorney, bringing case, cases to the courts of heaven and saying, Lord, you say Samuel is due for promotion, 
But look at what Samuel and his bloodline have been doing. How can you be promoted? And then the justice of God looks at your bloodline and sees that the blood of Jesus has not been applied to all these errors. And God is unable to help you. But right now in the courtrooms of heaven, the Lamb of God, who is also our King, who is also our Head, who is also our High Priest according to the order of Melchizedek. The Bible says He liveth continually to make intercession for us. Jesus is standing in the courtrooms of heaven as an intercessor. And then the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, the one who has been called alongside of us to help us, is also standing there. And then in Hebrews 12, from verse 1, the Bible says, we are encompassed, we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. There's a lot of intercession. Child of God, will you begin to pray? Rise up to your feet and begin to say, Heavenly Father, the just judge of the universe, the ancient of days, I come into the mercy court of heaven to receive mercy for the failures of my father's house, my mother's house, my spouse's father's house, my spouse's mother's house. I come before the courtrooms of heaven to receive mercy, to receive mercy on behalf of my bloodlines, every bloodline that I'm connected to by reason of birth, by reason of marriage, by reason of relationship, by reason of covenantal relationships, I am representing all of them. And I repent for all. I repent of the sins of my forefathers. I repent of my sin, the sins of my bloodlines. Me and my bloodlines, Lord, we have walked in error. We have walked in error. We have worshipped the fallen sons of God, forgive us. We have worshipped other gods, forgive us. We have walked in Repent, I don't forgive us. I am not black lines. We have done evil against you. Oh Lord, forgive us. Have mercy on our black lines. Our black lines have blood on their hands. There have been murders in these black lines. There have been abortions in these black lines. Children have been sacrificed to Molech in these black lines. There has been evil in these black lines. Adultery has been rampant. Fornication has been rampant. Sexual perversion in these bloodlines. These bloodlines, oh God, have sinned against you. We repent. People have traded with Lucifer in these bloodlines. We repent, oh God. People have traded with the fallen sons of God in these bloodlines. We repent, oh God. People have served the gods of the water. They have served the Nephilim. We repent of God. People have served the Queen of Heaven. We repent of God. People have worked for Mami Water. They have worked for Python Spirits. Serpentine Spirits. We repent of God. We repent Lord. We repent. We repent Lord. There has been evil in our bloodlines. Child abuse. Sexual abuse. Molestation of children. We have kept secrets in our bloodlines. We have kept secrets in our bloodlines. We kept quiet. We kept quiet. We come by the blood. 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 Have mercy on our bloodlines, oh Lord. Have mercy on our bloodlines. Have mercy on our bloodlines. Have mercy on our bloodlines. Have mercy, Lord. Forgive us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Brethren, I want you as you repent. You know, the Bible talks about sin. 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Sin means you've missed the mark. So, you remember like those people who play um, darts and they have a dartboard and there's a mark that the arrow has to hit. If you hit way outside, you've missed the mark. So, you were aiming for a righteous behavior. But what came out was laced with the fruit of the flesh. That's sinning. And then there's something else called transgression. That means God put a boundary and said, for example, thou shalt not steal. The minute you steal, you've transgressed the law. Right? And then now, sin and transgression are lower level. 
Then there's something called iniquity. When God was speaking after he gave them the Ten Commandments, he says he visits the iniquity of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate him. Now you say hate is a strong word. Man, I don't hate God. My father doesn't hate God. But anyone who doesn't do the will of God, God sees it as you hate him. Because you have covenanted with his enemies. And so you hate God. And he says to the third and fourth generation, that the iniquity of the fathers goes to the third and fourth. And when I was a child, growing up in the Orthodox Church, people misread this scripture. They thought that God is so mean. God is mean. He's just punishing kids for no reason. Because their mother was a witch. Because their mom was promiscuous. God is punishing these kids. But that's not what God does. What happens is, when there's iniquity in our bloodlines, iniquity means there is a crookedness. So, when Abraham, Father Abraham, when he first went to, the Bible says he went down to Egypt, and when he got to the kingdom of Pharaoh, and he checked out his wife, he was like, this woman's fine, man, fine girl, no pimple. Pharaoh's going to want my wife. And he started lying, and said Sarah was his sister. See, that was missing the mark. But he repeated it again. And then, he had a son, called Isaac. Isaac was not there when Abraham was lying about Sarah being his sister. Isaac comes. He also has a gorgeous babe, you know. And then he also, when he goes to the Abimelech, Abimelech is a title for the king of that region. He gets to the Abimelech and they say, who's this fine, fine girl? He's like, oh, she's my sister. Lying the same lie as his father now. He's gone beyond missing the mark. Now, there is sin. They keep transgressing. The sin, combined with the transgression, has given birth to iniquity. They are crooked. Why are they crooked? Because Abraham never set Isaac down and taught him to lie. Yet Isaac lied the same lie as his father. Because it's now embedded in his DNA. His DNA has become bent and crooked. And then when Isaac has Jacob and Esau, the iniquity is now a full grown man in Jacob so that he comes out of the womb as a swindler, as a supplanter and there was nothing he could do about it until he had to wrestle with God for a naming ceremony to become a new man. Israel, a prince with God and men. There was an iniquity of deception in their bloodline and unless if Jacob has not wrestled with God and been renamed as Israel, he would have given birth to the biggest 419 people in the world. Are you listening? So, when you are repenting, I want you to ask God because there is a forceps of the Holy Ghost that enters places where nobody has entered. In Hebrews 4.12, the Bible says, For the word of God is living and it is powerful and it is sharper than any two-edged sword to the tearing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow it goes into the bone marrow it goes into your DNA it goes into the red blood cells the white blood cells and the word of God is able to do like exploratory surgery to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit means this your spirit my spirit is already full I have Christ in me, the hope of glory. Amen. I have the fullness of the Holy Ghost because we have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. There's no problem with our spirit. But now, we have something else called a soul. Your mind, your intellect, the seat of your intellect, your will, your emotions. <laughs> Between the spirit and the physical body. So the physical manifestation you want in the natural realm. Between that and the spirit is the soul in the middle. Your spirit is already full. Your spirit could give birth to all sorts of miracles in this place. But before the spirit can download to the physical body, what God is saying about you, who you are, 
There is a soul that has a DNA that has history of bloodline iniquity and bloodline errors. And it is in the region of the soul that we start to replay the failures of yesterday. God forbid that for you. We must not. And every day you need to pray for your DNA and say, I don't care what was programmed in you, but you're not going to fail because you're a son of God. Are you with me? When you get to, I'm a son of God. Whatever is speaking in my DNA, that the iniquity means there is something in my bloodline that has not stopped talking. It's going from generation to generation. It spoke in your mother's life. It spoke in your grandmother's life. And it's trying to speak with you. If you let it speak, that's how it will speak in your children. So God doesn't visit the iniquity to the third and fourth generation by forcing us to suffer. No. What happens is you are brought up by a fallen human being who is walking according to patterns of iniquity. Their pattern could be anger, let's say. And so from the day you were born, even from the womb, you heard them fighting, shouting, going crazy. And everyone said, oh, that one has a short temper. And then they pass on the iniquity to you. You are born, you start hollering and shouting and getting angry. You get to have children, your children in the womb, hear your mother's anger, your anger combined, you give it to your kids. And unless somebody says enough is enough, that iniquity passes on. And because iniquity has judgments on it, then the family seems to be failing in the same way. Because iniquity has what? Judgments. So when we are doing this identification repentance, I'm saying you are asking Holy Spirit to do a deep work. So that when there are patterns of iniquity, they are uncovered and you are healed. Because once you are healed, God will issue a righteous verdict from heaven and say, loose him and let him go. Loose her and let her go. And that's the end of the story. Are you with me? So I want you to pray and say any bloodline patterns of iniquity from my father's side, my mother's side, my spouse's father's side, my mother's side. Lord, I present them to you, the word who is living and powerful, who is sharper than any two-edged sword. Examine me, Lord, examine my soul. Examine me, Lord, where there are patterns of iniquity. And I repent of all these patterns, Lord. Where in our hearts, Lord, iniquity has been bound. And iniquity is giving birth to more iniquity. And iniquity is bringing errors in our lineage. We are pleading the blood. We are pleading the blood. Every error in my bloodline, I submit it to the mercy of God. I submit it to the mercy of God. Don't be tired, child of God. Submit your family. Submit your bloodline to the mighty hand of God. Submit to the word of God who is living and powerful, who is sharper than any two-edged sword. Cleanse our bloodlines, oh God. Every sin, every transgression, every iniquity, we are pleading the blood. Every pattern of failure. Blood of Jesus. Lord, cleanse the iniquities of the bloodlines here. Cleanse the iniquities of the bloodline. Every bloodline error, Lord. We are pleading the blood. We are pleading the blood. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brethren, when they sin, when there's transgression, when there's iniquity, People sometimes get soul wounds. The soul gets wounded. When people sin against you, they can leave you with a wound. Or when you even sin against yourself, as you start to regret and feel guilty, a wound can appear. Now, in the realm of the natural, you might not see it. But in the realm of the spirit, it's easy to discern. And you know, like um, the enemy sometimes is called Beelzebub, the lord of the flies, right? Flies can discern when there's some kind of food that they need to sit upon. When there's rotting flesh, when there's things rotting, flies can just come out of nowhere. When you have a soul wound, in the realm of the spirit, it emits a sound. 
and a frequency that then attracts demonic activities. Where I come from in Zimbabwe, we have a lot of wild animals. You know, people come and go on safari. If there's an animal that is wounded and bleeding, all the predators will track it. The lions will not feel sorry for it. Oh, 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 that impala. It's a bit hurt. We're going to leave it alone. No, that's the one they want. And that's why some people wonder, why me? Every problem, every problem. Why is it me? Why me? Because in the realm of the spirit, your wound is smelling and is releasing pus and it's attracting demonic activity. You find some people, they were molested as a child, raped. When they grow up, they rape other children. And people say, what is wrong with them? No, it's because there was a soul wound that opened up in them. And then the enemy got legal ground to bring satanic reinforcement. Because remember, the devil doesn't want people to be free. Once anything binds you, he wants to bind more. Are you with me, child of God? In Psalm 23, what does the Bible tell us? He says, the Lord is my shepherd, isn't it? I shall not want. If he's my shepherd, that means I'm never out of his sight. My woes are continually before him. He guards me like the apple of his own eye. You say, where was Jesus when I was being molested? Where was Jesus when this woman abused me? Where was Jesus when these people did this? Jesus is right here by your side. But we have established that sometimes in our bloodlines, there were things that gave the enemy legal ground to attack. But the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me besides the still waters, right? And then what does he do? He restores my soul. Why would your soul need restoration? When a soul gets wounded, it needs restoration. So I want you to pray for yourself. Sometimes we are wounded. We don't even know we are wounded. We don't know there's a wound from when you were in primary school. In your second year. When one teacher said, look at her head. Look at his head. Huh? And gave you a nickname. And they said, oh well in Africa that's how people talk. Coconut head. Uh, whatever head. And a wound appeared. They're going to ask God. He says... All things are laid bare before the eyes of whom we have to give account, isn't it? Nothing is hidden from me. Lord, are there any wounds in my soul that are attracting demonic infestation? That are attracting the enemy? I am surrendering myself. Remember in Revelation 12, 11, it says they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony and they did not love their lives unto death. In other words, they surrendered themselves to God. Allow God to search you and find any areas of brokenness and let every soul wound be restored. Let there be healing in the inner man. Let there be healing in your soul. Let there be healing in your soul, in your mind. When your mind is healed, you are able to think like Christ because we have the mind of Christ. Why do you think like a failure? Because your mind is wounded. Why do you think with the mindset of lack? Anytime you see anything, the first thing you do is calculate how much money you have in the bank. That's not the mind of Christ. Let there be healing in the mind. Let there be healing in the mind. Healing in our will. Why is it that you cannot exercise your will in righteousness? Lord, heal my will. Where there are wounds, oh God, in my will. Lord, I'm pleading the blood of Jesus. In my emotions. Are there any negative emotions that are festering in your life? Ragadoso pregadelebosia. Lord, I pray for healing, healing in the emotions, every negative emotion. We submit to you under the power of the living God. For Jesus is our shepherd. We will not lack any good thing. He restores our soul. Be restored in the inner man. 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 Shakabale Gadosi. Lord heal your children Heal Lord Every soul wound From their bloodlines Heal in the name of Jesus In Jesus name we pray Sometimes Sometimes when people sin against us We make vows We say I will never again Let 
any man treat me like that. I will never again let any woman treat me like that. And what those vows do is they lock up the area of your heart. It becomes like Jericho. You remember Jericho in, 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 in Joshua 6? Bible says now Jericho was straightly shut. Nothing went in, nothing went out. When you take a vow, you shut the doors of your heart. God cannot come in either. Yes, friends cannot come in. But even God can't come in either. When there are vows taken, devil is always very happy. Because a person standing on a vow has stood in defiance and said, I don't need God to help me with this. I'm going to stand with my own willpower. And then your will is standing in the way of the will of God. What Jesus was battling with in the Garden of Gethsemane and saying, not my will, Lord, but your will be done. If you take a vow, you can't be like Jesus. You cannot surrender to God. And so I want you to examine yourself. Is there any area in your life that you've shut out? You're not allowing Holy Spirit in. You refuse to hear the voice of the Spirit. You try and take your own decision. Is there any vow you have made that is keeping God out? As an intercessor, you need to be surrendered to the will of God. As a prayer man, a prayer woman, you need to be surrendered. Now let go. Let go. Lord, I repent of every vow that I've made. Lord, I repent any vows, any vows that I've made. I repent, oh God. I repent. I surrender all. I surrender all to you. I'm withholding nothing. I'm withholding nothing. I'm withholding nothing. I'm withholding nothing. I surrender. I surrender. Vengeance is of the Lord. He will repay. I let it go. By an act of my will, I choose to surrender. prospers. The prosperity of your soul means victory. Because when your soul prospers, your physical body will prosper. When your soul is in prosperity, the other word for prosperity in Hebrew is shalom. Shalom, shalom. Shalom means wholeness. It means nothing is lacking. When you are in shalom, shalom, you think like Jesus. You have the faith of the Lord Jesus. You win victories like Jesus. And in the flesh, you can experience it because you can translate what is in the spirit realm into the natural realm. Because what is it that connects our physical body to the spirit is the soul, isn't it? So when you're in shalom, it means that your physical life changes and you walk with authority. You walk in power. Hallelujah. I want you to speak to your God. Lift up your hands to him and let him lay hands on you and say, I receive shalom. 3 John 2. Lord, you say it above all things. You pray that I will prosper and be in health even as my soul prospers. May I begin to prosper. Shalom in the name of Jesus. 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 Shalom in the name of
In the name of Jesus, Shana Masia Nalaba, Leba Oso Tonobo, Le Masia Nalaba. Lord, let there be healing of the DNA in this room, healing of the bloodlines. In the Mosia Nanamosia, 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 healing of the DNA, La Masika Lamosia, Nasekelebo, the Israelites and Jacob, whom you changed from Jacob to Israel. Lord, may our bloodlines help us in this house. Nakasenda Lemosia, Leba Musamanda, new beginnings, new beginnings, new beginnings, new beginnings in our bloodlines. Thank you, Jesus. Child of God, I want you to hear this. When Zachariah and Elizabeth, when they had their son, John, remember Zachariah had lost his speech when John was born. And the relatives had already started to say, we're going to call him Zachariah. And then the mother said, no, but his name shall be John by prophetic revelations because this is what the angel of the Lord said his name is John and then the father in his spirit agreed with the prophetic pronouncement of the mother as soon as he agreed he wasn't just agreeing with Elizabeth he was agreeing with the destiny scroll of that young man as written by the ancient of days because in Psalm 139 the Bible says even before I was formed in my mother's womb, you saw all my parts being knit together, and you saw all my days, and they were written in your book. You and I, we have destiny scrolls in the corridors of heaven. What is the assignment? The assignment is align to your destiny scroll. Whatever the scroll is saying, do it. Some people's scrolls are shut, and you want to pray that the Spirit of God will open up the destiny scroll. And you can read it. And I'll tell you why before you start praying. When Zechariah was made down by unbelief. Because that angel had to keep Zechariah's mouth shut. Because he discerned an element of unbelief. He said, we leave this guy. He's going to be saying the wrong thing and you'll abort the baby. So Zechariah, you will remain mute until John arrives. When Zechariah agreed in his spirit with Elizabeth. That the child is John. He must have said it in the spirit first. And that pronouncement in the spirit, it loosened his tongue. It loosened his tongue. And he was restored to his original position as the priest. And he could use his voice. His voice was loosed from the regions of captivity. And he was able to say, his name is John. So in other words, the people looked around and said, John, there's never been any John here in this family. In this bloodline, but they were saying, We have a new pattern, it's a new dawn, it's a new beginning. We are not the way we used to be. So, this one is called John, it's something that this bloodline has never seen. For eye has not seen and ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the hearts of men who this man is, who this daughter is. And that was a new beginning for them. So, I want you also to pray. Because child of God, I am convinced beyond any shadow of doubt that you are that John in your bloodline. I'm not saying your name is John. But there is a name God has for you. There is an assignment for you that is written in the scrolls of heaven. I want you to pray two things. Holy Ghost, enable me to read my destiny scroll. How do I know when you've read your scroll? You start saying the things that are in line with your assignment. You start praying like you mean it. You start preaching like you mean it. Something about you tells people that uh, 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 it's not the person you met yesterday. This one is a new creature. There's something going on. When you read your scroll, there's a way you're convinced beyond any shadow of doubt that this is the assignment. When you read your scroll, did you hear about the guy who wrote the algorithms for Google? Do you know he received them in a dream? And the God who gave him that dream is still giving dreams. I'm not talking about dreams about witches and wizards. But I mean even innovations, breakthroughs in your industry, breakthroughs in your field. God gave him the, the algorithms of Google. 
in the dreams. He woke up and brought them down. He ran to his professor and said, Professor, there's something here. La, 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 la. The professor said, crazy stuff. It's never going to happen. What are you talking about? That's just nonsense. Because the professor had not read the scroll. He did not know. He could not discern. Because it had nothing to do with him. And this guy wrote the algorithms of the Google we are using today. He got it by revelation. When you read your destiny scroll, you download what are the inventions. Even in prayer, Pastor B, God told me that a lot of people in the church, the technology of prayer they are using, he said it's 50 years behind the kingdom of darkness. He says some people are still doing deliverance, like how their, their grandfathers did it. It worked then, it doesn't work now. Even in prayer, there's technology. There is technology. There's technology for getting a breakthrough. There are some prayer points that I prayed 20 years ago. I can never pray now. And I'm not afraid to say it. When you raise me a prayer point of unbelief, I'll tell you to your face, I'm not praying it because it's a prayer of unbelief. I'm not praying it. But there were some things we prayed, we didn't know. But knowledge advances. The spirit of God, spirit of wisdom. So there are even some prayer points we shouldn't pray anymore. We need the technology. You are an apostolic voice. Receive the blueprint of the apostolic assignment. You are a prophet. Read the scroll. Begin to ask Holy Ghost. Open my eyes to read the destiny scroll. Because you told me. Even before I was formed in my mother's womb. You saw me. You knew my days. And you wrote all of them in your book. There is a destiny scroll in heaven. That has my destiny in it. May I begin to read my scroll. May I read my scroll. May I read my scroll. May I read my scroll. My substance is not hidden from you, O Lord. Even you made me in secret. You know me, O God. You know every side of me. Your thoughts, Lord. They are so great, they are wonderful. You have written them in the book about me. May I discern my destiny scroll. Lalalalalalabasetelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelelel